How's that? Is that better? Better. Okay. We have the sound of the shofar, so we're ready to begin. Why don't we stand? And there's just a few of us, so you're going to have to sing loud. So let's sing Shabbat Shalom together while they're getting ready to put the Shema up on for us. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Hey, Hallelujah. Can you imagine doing that in your church years ago? <laughs> Hallelujah. Please join with me in the Shema. Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, Baruch Shem, Evod Mahakuto Leholam Vayet. Hear, Israel, Yahweh our Elohim, Yahweh is one. Blessed is the name of his esteemed kingdom for all eternity. Amen. And then the Shema continues with the Ve'ahavta, which means that you shall love. Ve'ahavta et Yahweh Elohecha bekol levavacha uvekol nafshacha uvekol mehodecha ve'hayu hadvarim ha'ale asher hanoki mitzavacha yom alevavecha. Vishem nam tam lava neka virdi barta bam, Vishif teka baveheteka, Uva lak teka vaderek uvishark beka, Uv kuhumeka, Ukshartam leotayodeka. Veha yula tatafot ben he neka, Uktav tamo mazuzot vehe teka, Uhuvi shahareka. And you shall love Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day be upon your heart. Teach them diligently to your children, and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and write them on the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. Amen. And we have a blessing before the reading of the Torah. We can think of blessings for everything, can't we? No matter what you're doing, there's always a blessing that we can praise Yahweh for. A blessing before the reading of the Torah. Baruch et Yahweh hamivorach, Baruch Yahweh hamivorach leolam vayed, Baruch Yahweh hamivorach leolam vayed. Baruch ata Yahweh Eloheinu melech haolam, asher bar karbanu meko hahamim, venatan lanu et torato. Baruch ata Yahweh, Baruch shemo notein haTorah. Amen. Bless Yahweh, the Blessed One. Blessed is Yahweh, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has chosen us from among all peoples and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Yahweh, bless his name, giver of the Torah. Amen. 
And please remain standing if you can for the reading of the Torah. You'll turn in your scriptures to Bereshith, that's Genesis, and chapter 37. And we're going to be reading the whole chapter, beginning with verse 1. Chapter 37, verse 1. And Yaakov dwelt in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. This is the genealogy of Yaakov. Yosef, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the young man was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Yosef brought an evil report of them to his father. And Israel loved Yosef more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a long robe. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and were not able to speak peaceably to him. And Joseph dreamed a dream and told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. And he said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have dreamed. See, we were binding sheaves in the midst of the field. And see, my sheaf rose up and also stood up. And see, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Shall you indeed rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, See, I have dreamed another dream. And see, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to me. And he related it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall we, your mother and I and your brothers, indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father guarded the word. And his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Yosef, Are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I send you to them. So he said to him, Here I am. And he said to him, Please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the sheep, and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron, and he went to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and see, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What do you seek? And he said, I am seeking my brothers. Please inform me where they are feeding their sheep. And the man said, They have left here, for I heard them say, Let us go towards Dothan. So Yosef went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. And they saw him from a distance, and before he came near them, they plotted against him to kill him. And they said to each other, See, this master of dreams is coming. Now then, let us come, let us now kill him and throw him into some pit, and shall say, Some wild beast has devoured him. But let us then see what comes of his dreams. But Reuben heard and rescued him from their hands and said, Let us not strike his being. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him in order to rescue him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So it came to be when Yosef had come to his brothers, that they stripped Yosef of his robe, and his long robe, which was on him. And they took him and threw him into a pit. And the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. And they lifted up their eyes and looked and saw a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spices of balm and myrrh, going to take them down to Mitzrayim. And... Yehuda said to his brothers, What shall we gain if we kill our brothers and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our flesh. Our, and his brothers listened. And men, Midianite traders, passed by, so they pulled Yosef up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Yosef to Mitzrayim, and Reuben returned to the pit, and see, Yosef was not in the pit, and he tore his garments. 
and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, what am I to, where am I to go? So they took Yosef's robe, slew a male goat, and dipped the blood of the robe into the blood, and sent the long robe and brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Please look, is it the robe of your son or not? And he recognized it and said, It is my son's robe, and an evil beast has devoured him. Yosef is torn, torn to pieces. And Yaakov tore his garments, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, Now let me go down to Sheol to my son in mourning. So his father wept for him. And the Midianites had sold him in Mitzrayim to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard. Amen. And we have a blessing after the reading of the Torah. Baruch ata Yahweh Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu Torah temet, vakeye haolam nata betochenu. Baruch ata Yahweh, Baruch shemo noten haTorah. Amen. Blessed art you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has given us the Torah of truth and planted everlasting life within us. Blessed are you, Yahweh. Bless his name, giver of the Torah. Amen. And you may be seated. This Torah portion has a lot in it in relation to parallels that you can see with Yosef and our Messiah. When we go through and study this, it's amazing how he always revealing himself to us by the life of Joseph. Before we begin, let's pray. Abba Father, I thank you and praise you once again for this wonderful Shabbat day where we can come to gather before you, where you have revealed this to us so that we can be submissive to you, Yahweh. Oh, what a wonderful way of life to be submissive to our Messiah. I can't think of anything better than to know that we are pleasing to you. We desire to be Lifting up your name on this Shema, we desire to call upon your Ruach to come and teach us now. Help us and give us wisdom and discernment, Yahweh, into your Torah and show us within your Torah what you have for us and how to live. In Yeshua's name, amen. So the name of the Torah portion here begins in chapter 37, verse 1. The whole Torah portion actually goes through chapter 40, verse 23. I believe that's the whole chapter of chapter 40. And this whole scenario is not going to stop until we get to the end of Genesis in regards to Joseph and Amazing things that Yahweh wants to reveal to us. So looking at chapter 37 and verse 1. It says, And Yaakov dwelt in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. So the name of the Torah portion comes from, and he dwelt, which would be Vayeshev. So this week's Torah portion is called Vayeshev. And he dwelt. Now, when you look at the name of a Torah portion, 
It's interesting to see when you dig into the name of the Torah portion, all the different meanings that can come out of it, and it actually describes the whole Torah portion. So when I was looking into And He Dwelt, I noticed that, first of all, Vayeshev has four Hebrew letters. Yeah, we have to look at the four Hebrew letters. It's a joy to look at Yahweh's letters. Each one of them paints a picture, if you will, of our Messiah. So Vayeshev starts with a vav. A vav is like a nail. It looks like a nail. It's a picture language. So it looks like a nail. So it's how Yahweh brings us and connects us to the Father, if you will. Then there's a yod. It's his hand. So we got Yeshua connects us with his hand. And then a, a sheen. A sheen is like, it looks kind of like this, looks like a fire or maybe teeth. So it can be both. It's a picture of the lion of the tribe of Judah, which is, you guys, Yeshua, right? So he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Also, what does a fire remind you guys of? The what? The Ruach. Okay. I thought I heard you say that. So the Ruach. So you got, the, you got Yeshua, he's the connector, and he's the hand, and he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he's this, he's this amazing Ruach. This is all of Yahweh. And then the last letter is a bet, or a vet, depending on the pronunciation. And a bet is what, guys? House. Yeah. So you got Yahweh, Yeshua, is the connector and the hand that brings us to Yahweh the Father. And Yahweh Yeshua will battle against our enemies. He gives us strength, if you will, as the lion of the tribe of Judah to battle against our enemies and purify us with his ruach while keeping us safe in his house. That's just the letters of Vayeshev. Doesn't that paint a really cool picture for you guys? Would you ha have seen that if you just looked at and he dwelt? Why well, wouldn't have? So it's really cool to see that when you start digging into Yahweh's hidden, hidden meanings in the Torah and how it reveals our Messiah Yeshua in every letter of the Torah. John 14 Verse 6, believe, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's talking about Yeshua. It's talking about no one comes to the Father except through him. Okay. So, does that mean that Adam, Adam, needed Messiah Yeshua then to come to the Father? Sure. So, every man says... It says, no one comes to the Father, John 14, 6, except through me, Yeshua is talking. So, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. As we go along, any thoughts that come to your mind, please share them, okay? So I don't have to do all the talking. You know, guys, when I, when I looked up this word dwelt, keep in mind what I just told you about the Hebrew letters and how it painted a picture of our Messiah with every letter. But when I looked it up in the Strong's Concordance, the root word of it is yashav, which means to settle. What do you think of when you think of settle? A pioneer? The opposite of a pioneer. Settle down, okay? So we've all kind of settled down, right, in our homes where we live, okay? So we're settling down, and, we're, and our homes are on what? What are our homes on? A foundation, not good, okay? A foundation is our Messiah Yeshua, right? But what's underneath the foundation? 
Rocks? <laughs> okay. So the ground, right? The ground. So you have a ground, you have a house, you have a family. This is a, all a picture of what Yahweh Yahweh's painting for your, you as his people. So that's the first word I came across when I looked up dwelt, which is yashav. So to settle. Then the next word was marry. I'm not talking about happy. But I am talking about happy because when you get married, aren't you happy? Yeah. So it has to do with marriage. So first settle, and he's going to bring about this marriage. So what does that mean? What does the marriage mean in regards to dwelt? We're going to need a mic. <laughs> Steve can't hear real well, so he needs a mic. Thank you, sir. When two come together and become one and they build a family. Good. Okay. Come together, build a family. The next word that I came across was, or a phrase, was make to abide. So first, he's going to settle you, then he's marrying you, and he's going to make you to abide. Abide what? Abide in, in him, okay? I, I got to have a mic. I can't hear you guys. To abide in his law, in his Torah. Abide in his Torah. This is teaching and instruction, isn't it? It's, when, I, when you guys first learned about the Torah, you probably were thinking that it was law, right? Well, Torah is not law, but there's law in Torah. So Torah, when you look it up, has to do with teaching and instruction from a father that loves you and he wants you to follow his ways to keep you safe and to help to make you grow. So make to abide. So we've got settle, marry, make to abide. And then the next one was endure. Now, this doesn't have to do with enduring marriage. Because isn't marriage supposed to be a joyous union? Okay? So, because now you're, when you settle and you marry, and you're now abiding in him, what is going to take place for you in your life? Different events, right, are going to start to take place. You're going to start to have experiences. So he's going to help you to endure those experiences together. You're going to walk them out together. Right, guys? Just like, just like we, as a family, as brothers and sisters, get to walk out our life experiences together. Hallelujah. He's a husband to us. Very good. He also talks about that he is, uh, his yoke is light. Okay, and um, you know, I know that when, when Sharon and I first got married, we kind of went, diff you know, different directions to do things and found out that that kind of causes conflict. And as we began to do things together and work together on things, it created unity to where we, we were both on the same shit of music. And also the work um, that was done is... Uh, is lighter and done better uh, when you do that thing. So, you know, the marriage actually is a time where we not only dwell, but we're yoked with him so that we can begin to, to uh, work, do things his way. That way, the, the yoke becomes light and, and also the, the work is done the way he wants it done. I mean, good. Anyone else? Any thoughts about that? I, this Torah portion, the last Torah portions, it's all about family and, and being a cod and becoming a cod. We, we're, we're talking his brothers are come against him. This is Yosef. He's the, the seed planter, the one that's going to carry on 
and 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 in our last two portions, it was about Jacob and Esau and, and that family, and his brother comes against him, and how, and we know the end of the stories is uh, Jacob reconciles with Esau, and, but Esau goes a different way. And we're going to find that Yosef reconciles with his brothers. How many of us have been attacked by our brother? If we're bringing forth the word and planting that seed, our brother, that we are going to have brothers that come against us. But this, as Yosef said, it's of Yahweh that this has happened. To go through this trial, it's for you or your brother. And you don't know what the end your brother is going to be like Esau and turn away from Jacob, or that the, it, this conflict will, in the end, cause him to come back as Joseph's brothers did. And so we always treat our brother with loving kindness, even when they're coming against us, because we don't know the end, what Yahweh has for this, and we can rejoice in that, even that. I ain't afraid of the Muslim hordes. People... Uh, even in these stories, people get caught up on how evil Esau is and how evil these brothers are. But, and we're living in these end times and people are worried about the Muslims or Obama, what he's doing. I, I, I want to be prepared not for that, but for dealing with my brother during the tribulation. That's the thing that I believe is most important, not dealing with Obama or or these great evils, but it's my brother, how I treat him when he comes against me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yahweh wants to reestablish, he wants to restore his people back to himself, and when he does that, restores you back to himself, then that's going to affect your relationship with your brother. Thank you, Darren. The last word, and that was all the endure part, right? So we're enduring together. Um, Paul talks about enduring with one another in, the script, in his writings. And we need to have that from our Abba. It's not something that you can, is that something that you can pull up on your own and use a tool that you just uh, have within yourself? I think not. I think it's all from Yahweh. Gives you the ability to do that. The last word is establish. So this dwelt, when he dwells, he's settling you. He's going to marry you and make you to abide within himself and endure your trials that have to come to help you grow. He's going to establish you as his people when you do that. And you know, turn to Psalm 91. This whole definitions here reminded me of Psalm 91. And when we were having a class on Psalm 91 and our teacher taught us all about the different aspects of Psalm 91 that he saw. Psalm 91 verse 1 says, And he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, who abides under the shadow of the Almighty, he is saying of Yahweh, my refuge and my stronghold, and Elohim, my Elohim in whom I trust. Doesn't that sound like what we've been talking about so far? Psalm 91 goes on and talks about all these wonderful things where you can, you, you can be protected by your Abba when you are weak, but he gives you the strength to come out and be able to battle against the enemy with the strength that he gives you. Hallelujah. Within this first verse that we've been talking about, we've gleaned a whole bunch of things already, right? Well, in the King James Bible, it says, and Yaakov dwelt in the land of uh, his father's sojournings, or where with, wherein his father was a stranger. My scripture says in where the land of his father's sojournings. 
King James says, wherein his father was a stranger. Does that bring any thoughts to your mind? Do you guys see perhaps maybe by that wording where my father was a stranger? Wherein his father was a stranger. He's dwelling in the land of Canaan. Okay? So how, how would, if you go into a spiritual application of this, how would wherein his father was a stranger be likened to a spiritual application? Because he's in the land of Canaan. Who's Canaan? Pat. Need a mic right here. So I can hear you. Uh, I was thinking, our father, Abba, is a stranger in the land of Canaan. Very good. Do you get my notes and read them? <laughs> Maybe it's the Ruach that does that. Brings us all together into one mind. Do you think that's possible, you guys? That when we're studying his Torah, what Pat just said is what I had down in my notes is exactly what brothers and sisters are supposed to do. We're supposed to be taught by him, our Ruach, our Abba. So very good. So that could be a spiritual application, if you will. Wherein his father was a stranger. Yaakov, it's talking about Yaakov's father. Who's Yaakov's father? Huh? Yitzhak? Yitzhak, Avraham, can go back farther. But, but what Pat was saying is that this could be likened to our Abba Father. Because our Abba Father, wouldn't Kenanon be like a stranger to our Abba Father? Who's Kenanon? Let's go back to Genesis, where the first mention of Kenanon, Genesis 10. He's somebody's son, right? Genesis 10, 6. And the sons of Ham, Cush, Mitzrayim, Put, and Kenanon. Now, in your Bible, it probably says, like, Canaan, or Kenanon, would be C-A-N-A-A-N. The ISR uses a different spelling. It says, they use K-E-N-A-A-N. Kenanon. Now, Cain, don't let Canaan be, confuse you with Cain at the beginning of scriptures. That's not the same man. Okay, this, this guy here had sin issues, unrepented sin issues, the son of, of Ham, Kenanon. They had to do with very immoral things. Okay, so when we look at our Torah portion and it says, in the King James, wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Abba Father is with Yaakov in the land of Canaan. The land of Canaan is, is inhabited by this whole clan of, of descendants of this man that had all these sin issues that are unrepentant. So these descendants in this land of Canaan are still practicing that same thing. More than likely, most of them. That's why it says he's a stranger. You're always going to be a stranger to, to um, anything that doesn't line up with him, right? So, therefore, if he is, we're supposed to be strangers to it too, right? It's not sp supposed to be familiar to us. We're supposed to be strangers to that sort of w way of life. That's what I was trying to get you across. You mean we're not supposed to partake in the Christmas hum? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I always relate yeah. the two together. Right. And it is the ways of the Canaanites right. that that represents. Okay. Lots of things that we're learning as we're going through, right? Things that, that we used to do that when we think about it, we think of, oh, how I must, be, must have been displeasing to you, Yahweh when I did those things like ate ham. But isn't it, isn't it great that Yahweh is merciful 
and long-suffering, long-suffering towards his people, and constantly wooing them to draw closer to him so we can follow his ways more complete. You know what? You're never going to arrive completely. It's a lifetime of learning from the Torah. Amen. But we can come close, perhaps. Okay. So could you say then that we are in the world but not of the world? That's kind of a combination of verses. In the world but not of the world. Any thoughts so far? If you love the world, you're an enemy of Yahweh. Okay? Anyone else? Any thoughts so far? Rick? Yeah, I was just thinking, is it that we're still in bondage and we're just now coming to light to try to learn and understand what we're coming up with? Okay. Pastor Rick? You know, it, the Psalms 91 passage is kind of interesting to me because it says that the one who dwells in the shadow of, the, of, of Yahweh. And, you know, as I was thinking that out, uh, I, I don't know how many of you like to stay in the shadows of things, but, you know, the shadow moves uh, depending on where the sun moves. And, you know what, it, it, there's, there's two things that I, that I was thinking about there. Is one of them, we have to continually move as his shadow moves. Okay, to stay within the shadow. Also, we have to choose not to, to leave the shadow or the protection. Um, so we can actually mess up two ways by not watching and not whist- listening, but also by going out into um, areas or, or be, a, be an enemy or go away from his shadow on our own. Mm-hmm. And, and so... I really like this idea, that, and I, I think that there's a lot there to understand about, about being in his shadow. You know, it talks about all, all time, it talks about the, the shadow of the wings, you know, that how long he, he had um, longed to have, you know, to, to be hit or, or to cover them with his wings, all these kinds of things, you know, and, and that they wouldn't do it, they wouldn't, they wouldn't listen, they wouldn't be under the shadow of his wings. And so, you know, to me, it seems like he talks about this shadow a lot. Um, and we probably ought to take, pay attention to that. You know, um, how do I stay within that shadow? Good. Anyone else? Well, we're, we're, um, we're in the world, as we all know. Um, my brother Ken and I, we go to uh, various uh, motorcycle clubhouses now. Do we partake of what's going on there? No. We make relationships with, you know, outlaw bikers and whatever else. And, uh, you know, they see that light. And they respect that light. But are we doing what they're doing? Are we drinking? Are we, are we partying? No. We're sharing our sober, clean and sober mm. testimony. Hallelujah. Good for you. Amen. That's part of being in the world, but not of the world, right? Amen. I have a story from missionary friends from Montana, and they were over in the Mediterranean in their ministry over there with another couple. One particular day they went to the Mediterranean beach, and it was a cloudy day, and they had an umbrella over them, and they were under the umbrella for the most part, except the missionary friend had his foot outside of the shadow of the umbrella. And though it was overcast, he received third degree burns, second or third degree burns on his foot because he was not under the shadow of the umbrella. Oh, interesting. Someone else, someone else. That comes, that comes from Psalm 121. You know, didn't you guys at first 
when you first started to come into perhaps a, an introduction, somebody introduced you to, to Torah, at least just that word, Torah, did it seem strange to you? Did that word Torah seem strange to you at first when you first heard it? Well, it did to me, but there was something that drew me to that word Torah. And that'd be Yahweh. He's going to draw you to it, but it's going to seem strange at first. And so this whole idea of, of Yaakov dwelling in the land wherein his father was a stranger in this land of Canaan can be likened to Israel, who doesn't know about Yahweh's ways yet. They don't even know that they're Israel. Okay? Turn to Hoshea. Hosea, Hoshea, Hoshea chapter 8, and actually verse 8, Israel has been swallowed up, they have now become among the nations as a vessel in which is no pleasure, for they themselves have gone up to Ashur, a wild donkey alone by itself is Ephraim, they have hired lovers, doesn't that break your heart? to know that that's what your forefathers did. Verse 10, also, although they sold themselves among the nations, this time I shall gather them when they have suffered for a little while from the burden of a sovereign of rulers. Since Ephraim has made many altars for sin, they have been altars for sinning to him. I have written to him numerous matters of my Torah. They were regarded as strange. So in Hoshea, he's saying that Ephraim, Israel, you and me, regarded at one time Yahweh's Torah as strange. What wasn't strange to you was the lifestyle that you were leading. It was just fine. It was normal. It was what everybody else did, right? All your relatives, all your friends, all your Christian friends. There is a, not an attack against Yahweh's people by Yahweh's people, but an attack against what they were into, what they were doing that was not pleasing to Yahweh. That's what we want to come against, what's not your brothers and sisters, but what, what we're doing that is not pleasing to him. Did Yahweh say to go do certain celebrations that are outside his Torah that we used to do? No, he didn't, and they're not pleasing to him. And so Yahweh is revealing that to his people slowly. Little by little, Inch by inch, don't you know it's a cinch when we get it that way. Hallelujah. That was a little kid song I used to sing to my girls when they were growing up. It has, it has profound meaning for us adults too. <laughs> oh man. Verse 2 says, this is the genealogy of Yaakov. The word in the Hebrew is taldot, and it can mean generations, genealogy. It can also mean chronicles or history. So based on what we read in chapter 37, what would you pick out as the word for the meaning for taldot here? Would you pick out generations, genealogy, chronicles, or history? What word would you use for? And Yosef being 17 years old, and then goes into the whole history of, of descendants of Yaakov, right? So, this word, generations, or genealogy that you may have in your King James Bible, may not have been exactly the word that you would use, but you have to go back to the original word, Taldot, and look at the meanings and say, okay, this is more lines up with what the Torah is saying. doesn't mean you can't trust your Bible, guys. It just means that we need to study, okay? 
Um, I was looking at this as, uh, as uh, Jacob represents the end. And if you look at it as this is the history of the end, I think you will see that the end is back in that land and that um, this is the story of how we get there. Good. Oh, man. Good observation. Oh, man. Anyone else? Pat's my next door neighbor. This is Pat, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Now we know where you're getting all your information for this yeah. stuff. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, when we first moved in next to Pat and Cliff, I came over to their house to introduce myself, and then pretty soon we got, became good friends, and, and um, Cliff, Pat's husband, brought me over to show me some remodeling they needed to do in their bathroom, and so I walked down the hallway, and I happened to look in this one room, and there was a bunch of study material, and there was a red book in there. You guys know what the red book is? Kleins. And I thought, I know what she does. She studies Torah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, man. Isn't it amazing how Yahweh brings his people together? Oh, man. Hmm. So this is the history of Yaakov, verse 2. This is the, it, it starts to talk about Yosef and what all happened with him and all his brothers and so on. So who's responsible for what's going on in that family? Is Yaakov responsible? Or is it not him at all and it's just, they're just falling away from Yahweh. What do you guys think? Makes you want to dance almost. <laughs> you know, a father can teach his children all the ways of Yahweh. Maybe we fail in some areas. Yeah. As, as you were just saying, um, I think um, Jacob had full responsibility of his, his family while they're into his house. And as they leave, leave his home, I, I think, you know, at that point, he's not responsible for them because they're not under his tent. Okay. Someone else? Does everybody agree with David? Yes, there's a, David brings a very good point. You know, yeah, they probably had their own tents. They're all dwelling together. They're supposed to be a family, right? Just like we are. Yeah, we don't, we don't all write tents all together. But we're supposed to be a family. We're supposed to be of one mind. I think that when you love each other, which they didn't hear, there was hatred going on. There was envy going on, right, guys? Is that significant? with Yahweh's people, hate and envy going on? Is there something that needs to be corrected, obviously? Verse 2 says, again, this is the genealogy of Yaakov, Yosef being 17 years old. In the Hebrew, it actually says... That Joseph was a shepherd by his brothers, feeding the flock with his brothers. It actually uses the Hebrew word for shepherd here. What's, and, and his brothers are supposed to be shepherds. What is the characteristics supposed to be of shepherds? Is it supposed to be hate and envy? No. <laughs> So it's supposed to be caring, loving, nurturing, because that's what you do with a flock, right? A flock of sheep. You're going to care for them and nurture them. 
because they really are dumb. They're going to do dumb things. Sheep. Sheep do dumb things. I'm not, I'm not likening you guys to sheep. I'm just saying that there's, there's, there's issues with sheep, right? We're all sheep. Okay. You're right. We're all sheep. What would you, I mean, say? Shepherd has to lead them. Okay. If you don't have the mic, I'm going to repeat what you said if I can hear it. Okay. So, yeah, that's true. We have the, the shepherd has to, is supposed to lead this flock. So Yaakov is supposed to be the shepherd. I mean, Jacob is supposed to be this, um, this shepherd that is followed. Yeah. I can almost hear you. Almost. <laughs> he didn't do a very good job because his sons ended up doing what they would. They did. Could you repeat what she said for me? Somebody repeat what she said. She said that uh, he didn't do a very good job because they turned out that way. Okay. They made a lot of mistakes. Made a lot of mistakes. Said. Don't we? We as parents have made a lot of mistakes. Yahweh is gracious once again in helping us. Once we see the mistake, we're supposed to correct it, right? Amen. Pastor Rick. And you know what? The, the truth is, is he did follow some of the shepherding that he was under. Um, the, the whole family made the same mistakes. Um, and you see this, this whole pattern going, and, and we all do it. We, you know, we do it as well. Um, you know, we, we've been shepherded, whether we have recognized it that way or not, we've been shepherded, and it, it's, it's natural, and it feels comfortable, and it's, it's all of these things, when in reality what it is is a familiar spirit that we're not addressing. And uh, they didn't address it either because it was familiar to them. And that's, what, that's the way they grew up. You've heard it. You've even, maybe even said it. Uh, oh, well, in my house, that's the way we did things. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's an easy way to justify continuing. Oh, man. So why is it important that Yaakov... Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Yosef, Moshe, David, Yeshua, all have this characteristic of shepherd. Why is that important? Turn back to chapter 35 of Genesis here. Verse 9 says, And Elohim separated Yaakov again. Or Elohim appeared to Yaakov again, verse 9, when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And Elohim said to him, Your name is Yaakov. Your name is no longer called Yaakov, but Israel is your name. So he called his name Israel. And Elohim said to him, I am El Shaddai, be fruitful and increase. A nation and company of nations shall be from you, and sovereigns shall come from your body. And the land which I gave Avraham Yitzhak, I give to you. And to your seed after you, I give this land. So, when it says in our Torah portion, and this is the genealogy of Yaakov, it's not just talking about the man. Because Yaakov's name was changed to Israel. Who, are you guys Israel? Yeah, we're Israel, right? Okay, so if we know that we're Israel, this is the, this is the history of you. Going back to Yosef, going back all the way to the garden, actually. Righteousness is described with shepherds, if you will. Shepherds and sojourners. That's kind of the characteristic of, of these men that I mentioned. All the way up to Yeshua. Righteousness. Unrighteousness has to do with 
of the earth or of the field. Like who? Who was of the earth or of the field? Who was unrighteous? Who was unrighteous? Who was of the field of the earth? Esau? Cain. Cain and Esau, two good examples. That's opposite. Yahweh wants for his people this righteousness to be your characteristic. Not to, not to have hatred towards your brother or envy towards your brother. That's displeasing to Yahweh. It grieves him. He's going to turn away from you. Do you want Yahweh to turn away from you? No. We want him to look upon us with saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Right, guys? Amen. Any thoughts so far that you want to share? So we need, we need Yeshua to teach us Putting in this way. together um, uh, Jacob and um, Abraham on that, um, how you change a person is you change their name first, if you want to change the identity of them. So as looking at that, um, both of them were changed. And like you said, uh, Jacob was Israel. And that's who we're supposed to be, too, as we come in and, and are born again. We become grafted in to Israel. And Amen. so I look at that as how am I acting as Israel or am I still in the world compromising things? Um, so it is very important. And, and a shepherd is the same as Yeshua saying, go and make disciples. Because he's, father, he's doing what the Father taught Yeshua to do, and Yeshua is teaching his disciples, which is supposed to be come down to us now, uh, that we're walking in the Father's ways. Good. That, that's so key to, to realize what a blessing it is to realize that we are Israel, and that we can make, um, in churchianity, that... that, that if they, if you can just, if they could just realize that that is a part of their heritage. The problem is, is Hasatan's convinced us to separate the two, that we're not Israel, so therefore the Old Testament don't apply to us. But that is our history, our lineage. Those are our fathers, that is our household. That, that it, it, we, we can own it then. Now, if you have the idea that you're not Israel, you can study that and study that, but you don't own, own it. It isn't yours. And that makes the world a difference in opening up the understanding of the Scripture. Amen. I'd like to close with just um, a passage, passage from Hosea, Hosea, chapter 11. I've quoted this passage to you before, but it's fitting. Chapter 11, verse 1 says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Mitzrayim I called my son. They called to them, so they went from their face. They slaughtered to Baals and burned incense to carved images. And I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms but they did not know that I healed them. I drew them with ropes of man, with cords of love, and I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck, and I bent down and I fed them. Isn't that a merciful and loving Yah that would do that for us? He teaches you to walk by healing you. At the same time, he's teaching you to walk, he's healing you, and you didn't even know you were being healed. He removes that yoke from our neck, that yoke of, say, works for salvation or, you know, it's, it's works because of salvation. That's not a yoke. But the other way around is, or false theologies or whatever, Yahweh is taking off of you that weight that you were unable to bear or that our forefathers were unable to bear. He's removing that from you because... He's drawing you and healing you, and he's bending down before you. Can you picture, guys, in your mind's eye, 
Yeshua bending down in front of you and feeding you. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Abba Father, thank you and praise you once again for sending your Ruach to teach us. Father, if there's anything that I have said that is not of you, I pray that it would be stricken from the minds of your people. Yahweh, I pray for each heart here that you would lift them up. Lift up each heart here, Yah, and give encouragement to each heart as we do the same. As you do that, Father, let us do the same. Let us encourage one another in you. I thank you and praise you now and how you're going to work in the days ahead and in this, the rest of our service today and our rejoicing and fellowshipping together. In Yeshua's name and in your name, O Yahweh, Amen. And you are dismissed for fellowship.